Chapter 17 of In His Steps. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. M. Hammond. In His Steps by Charles Monroe Sheldon. Chapter 17. The next day she went down to the news office to see Edward Norman and arrange the details of her part in the establishment of the paper on its new foundation. Mr. Maxwell was present at this conference, and the three agreed that whatever Jesus would do in detail as editor of a daily paper, he would be guided by the same spiritual principles that directed his conduct as the Savior of the world. I have tried to put down here in concrete form some of the things that it has seemed to me Jesus would do, said Edward Norman. He read from a paper lying on his desk, and Maxwell was reminded again of his own effort to put into written form his own conception of Jesus' probable action, and also of Milton Wright's same attempt in his business. I have headed this What Would Jesus Do as Edward Norman, editor of a daily newspaper in Raymond. Number one. He would never allow a sentence or a picture in his paper that could be called bad or coarse or impure in any way. Number two, he would probably conduct the political part of the paper from the standpoint of nonpartisan patriotism, always looking upon all political questions in the light of their relation to the kingdom of God, and advocating measures from the standpoint of their relation to the welfare of the people, always on the basis of what is right, never on the basis of what is for the best interest of this or that party. In other words, he would treat all political questions as he would treat every other subject from the standpoint of the advancement of the kingdom of God on earth. Edward Norman looked up from the reading a moment. You understand, that is my opinion of Jesus' probable action on political matters in a daily paper. I am not passing judgment on other newspaper men who may have a different conception of Jesus' probable action from mine. I am simply trying to answer honestly, what would Jesus do as Edward Norman? And the answer I find is what I have put down. Number three, the end and aim of a daily paper conducted by Jesus would be to do the will of God. That is, his main purpose in carrying on a newspaper would not be to make money or gain political influence, but his first and ruling purpose would be to so conduct his paper that it would be evident to all his subscribers that he was trying to seek first the kingdom of God by means of his paper. This purpose would be as distinct and unquestioned as the purpose of a minister or a missionary or any unselfish martyr in Christian work anywhere. Number four, all questionable advertisements would be impossible. Number five, the relations of Jesus to the employees on the paper would be of the most loving character. So far as I have gone, said Norman again, looking up, I am of opinion that Jesus would employ practically some form of cooperation that would represent the idea of a mutual interest in a business where all were to move together for the same great end. I am working out such a plan, and I am confident it will be successful. At any rate, once introduce the element of personal love into a business like this, take out the selfish principle of doing it for personal profits to a man or company, and I do not see any way except the most loving personal interest between editors, reporters, pressmen, and all who contribute anything to the life of the paper. And that interest would be expressed not only in the personal love and sympathy, but in a sharing with the profits of the business. 6. As editor of a daily paper today, Jesus would give large space to the work of the Christian world. He would devote a page, possibly, to the facts of reform, of sociological problems, of institutional church work, and similar movements. 7. He would do all in his power in his paper to fight the saloon as an enemy of the human race and an unnecessary part of our civilization. He would do this regardless of public sentiment in the matter, and of course, always regardless of its effect upon his subscription list. Again, Edward Norman looked up. I state my honest conviction on this point. Of course, I do not pass judgment on the Christian men who are editing other kinds of papers today. But as I interpret Jesus, I believe he would use the influence of his paper to remove the saloon entirely from the political and social life of the nation. Number 8. Jesus would not issue a Sunday edition. Number 9. He would print the news of the world that people ought to know. Among the things they do not need to know, and which would not be published, would be accounts of brutal prize fights, long accounts of crimes, scandals in private families, or any other human events which in any way would conflict with the first point mentioned in this outline. Number 10. If Jesus had the amount of money to use on a paper which we have, he would probably secure the best and strongest Christian men and women to cooperate with him in the matter of contributions. That will be my purpose, as I shall be able to show you in a few days. 11. 
Whatever the details of the paper might demand, as the paper developed along its definite plan, the main principle that guided it would always be the establishment of the kingdom of God in the world. This large general principle would necessarily shape all the detail. Edward Norman finished reading the plan. He was very thoughtful. I have merely sketched a faint outline. I have a hundred ideas for making the paper powerful that I have not thought out fully as yet. This is simply suggestive. I have talked it over with other newspaper men. Some of them say I will have a weak, namby-pamby Sunday school sheet. If I get out something as good as a Sunday school, it will be pretty good. Why do men, when they want to characterize something as particularly feeble, always use a Sunday school as a comparison when they ought to know that the Sunday school is one of the strongest, most powerful influences in our civilization in this country today? But the paper will not necessarily be weak because it is good. Good things are more powerful than bad. The question with me is largely one of support from the Christian people of Raymond. There are over 20,000 church members here in this city. If half of them will stand by the news, its life is assured. What do you think, Maxwell, of the probability of such support? I don't know enough about it to give an intelligent answer. I believe in the paper with all my heart. If it lives a year, as Miss Virginia said, there is no telling what it can do. The great thing will be to issue such a paper, as near as we can judge, as Jesus probably would, and put into it all the elements of Christian brains, strength, intelligence, and sense, and command respect for freedom from bigotry, fanaticism, narrowness, and anything else that is contrary to the spirit of Jesus. Such a paper will call for the best that human thought and action is capable of giving. The greatest minds in the world would have their powers taxed to the utmost to issue a Christian daily. Yes, Edward Norman spoke humbly. I shall make a great many mistakes, no doubt. I need a great deal of wisdom. But I want to do as Jesus would. What would he do? I have asked it and shall continue to do so and abide by the results. I think we are beginning to understand, said Virginia, the meaning of that command, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I am sure I do not know all that he would do in detail until I know him better. That is very true, said Henry Maxwell. I am beginning to understand that I cannot interpret the probable action of Jesus until I know better what his spirit is. The greatest question in all of human life is summed up when we ask, what would Jesus do? If, as we ask it, we also try to answer it from a growth in knowledge of Jesus himself. We must know Jesus before we can imitate him. When the arrangement had been made between Virginia and Edward Norman, he found himself in possession of the sum of $500,000 to use for the establishment of a Christian daily paper. When Virginia and Maxwell had gone, Norman closed his door and, alone with the Divine Presence, asked like a child for help from his all-powerful Father. All through his prayer as he kneeled before his desk ran the promise, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Surely his prayer would be answered, and the kingdom advanced through this instrument of God's power, this mighty press, which had become so largely degraded to the base uses of man's avarice and ambition. Two months went by. They were full of action and of results in the city of Raymond, and especially in the first church. In spite of the approaching heat of the summer season, the after-meeting of the disciples, who had made the pledge to do as Jesus would do, continued with enthusiasm and power. Gray had finished his work at the rectangle, and an outward observer going through the place could not have seen any difference in the old conditions, although there was an actual change in hundreds of lives. But the saloons, dens, hovels, gambling houses still ran, overflowing their vileness into the lives of fresh victims to take the place of those rescued by the evangelist and the devil recruited his ranks very fast. Henry Maxwell did not go abroad. Instead of that, he took the money he had been saving for the trip and quietly arranged for a summer vacation for a whole family living down in the rectangle who had never gone outside of the foul district of the tenements. The pastor of the first church will never forget the week he spent with this family making the arrangements. He went down into the rectangle one hot day when something of the terrible heat in the horrible tenements was beginning to be felt and helped the family to the station and then went with them to a beautiful spot on the coast where, in the home of a Christian woman, the bewildered city tenants breathed for the first time in years the cool salt air and felt blow about them the pine-scented fragrance of a new lease of life. There was a sickly babe with the mother and three other children, one a cripple. 
the father who had been out of work until he had been as he afterwards confessed to maxwell several times on the edge of suicide sat with the baby in his arms during the journey and when maxwell started back to raymond after seeing the family settled the man held his hand at parting and choked with his utterance and finally broke down to maxwell's great confusion the mother a wearied worn-out woman who had lost three children the year before from a fever scourge in the rectangle sat by the car window all the way and drank in the delights of sea and sky and field it all seemed a miracle to her and maxwell coming back into raymond at the end of that week feeling the scorching sickening heat all the more because of his little taste of the ocean breezes thanked god for the joy he had witnessed and entered upon his discipleship with a humble heart knowing for almost the first time in his life this special kind of sacrifice for never before had he denied himself his regular summer trip away from the heat of raymond whether he felt in any great need of rest or not it is a fact he said in reply to several inquiries on the part of his church i do not feel in need of a vacation this year i am very well and prefer to stay here it was with a feeling of relief that he succeeded in concealing from every one but his wife what he had done with this other family he felt the need of doing anything of that sort without display or approval from others so the summer came on and maxwell grew into a large knowledge of his lord the first church was still swayed by the power of the spirit maxwell marveled at the continuance of his stay he knew very well that from the beginning nothing but the spirit's presence had kept the church from being torn asunder by the remarkable testing it had received of its discipleship even now there were many of the members among those who had not taken the pledge who regarded the whole movement as mrs winslow did in the nature of a fanatical interpretation of christian duty and looked for the return of the old normal condition meanwhile the whole body of disciples was under the influence of the spirit and the pastor went his way that summer doing his parish work in great joy keeping up his meetings with the railroad men as he had promised alexander powers and daily growing into a better knowledge of the master early one afternoon in august after a day of refreshing coolness following a long period of heat jasper chase walked to his window in the apartment house on the avenue and looked out on his desk lay a pile of manuscript since that evening when he had spoken to rachel winslow he had not met her his singularly sensitive nature sensitive to the point of extreme irritability when he was thwarted served to thrust him into an isolation that was intensified by his habits as an author all through the heat of summer he had been writing his book was nearly done now he had thrown himself into its construction with a feverish strength that threatened at any moment to desert him and leave him helpless he had not forgotten his pledge made with the other church members at the first church it had forced itself upon his notice all through his writing and ever since rachel had said no to him he had asked a thousand times would jesus do this would he write this story it was a social novel written in a style that had proved popular it had no purpose except to amuse its moral teaching was not bad but neither was it christian in any positive way jasper chase knew that such a story would probably sell he was conscious of powers in this way that the social world petted and admired what would jesus do he felt that jesus would never write such a book the question obtruded on him at the most inopportune times he became irascible over it the standard of jesus for an author was too ideal of course jesus would use his powers to produce something useful or helpful or with a purpose what was he jasper chase writing this novel for why what nearly every writer wrote for money money and fame as a writer there was no secret with him that he was writing this new story with that object he was not poor and so had no great temptation to write for money but he was urged on by his desire for fame as much as anything he must write this kind of matter but what would jesus do the question plagued him even more than rachel's refusal was he going to break his promise did the promise mean much after all he asked as he stood at the window roland page came out of the clubhouse just opposite jasper noted his handsome face and noble figure as he started down the street he went back to his desk and turned over some papers there then he came back to the window roland was walking down past the block and rachel winslow was walking beside him roland must have overtaken her as she was coming from virginia's that afternoon jasper watched the two figures until they disappeared in the crowd on the walk then he turned to his desk and began to write when he had finished the last page of the last chapter of his book it was nearly dark what would jesus do he had finally answered the question by denying his lord it grew darker in his room he had deliberately chosen his course urged on by his disappointment and loss End of chapter seventeen